Hi, my name is Martin Wensing. I'm one of the interns at Nepean Hospital, and today I'm going to be talking about pulmonary embolism. So the definition is that it's a potentially life-threatening condition which occurs when a thrombi occludes the pulmonary vasculature. So to start off with then we have to get a thrombus. Now the thrombus forms in the deep venous system and it forms as a result of three factors uh, which are collectively known as Virchow's triad. Now those three factors are venous stasis, endovascular injury and hypercoagulability. So when those are present, you can get the thrombus formation. Uh, just a, qu a quick plug, Verkow. Um, I'm currently watching uh, a TV series called Charity, and that's actually based around a hospital called Charity in the late 1800s where Verkow worked. There's a few other quite prominent um, medical figures who were at that hospital at the same time. So enough about that. Once the thrombus is formed in the deep venous system, there's a uh, roughly 50% chance it will embolize to the pulmonary vasculature. Now, when that embolus becomes lodged in the pulmonary vasculature, I like to think of it as it results in essentially two things. Now, the first is that the oxygenated lung tissue, or is that there's oxygenated lung tissue now with no blood supply. So essentially what I mean by that is you have a working pulmonary tissue. Um, however, because there's no blood coming through to it, you're not getting gas exchange happening and therefore um, you get decreased oxygen saturations. Now, the second thing which happens is because you've got an occlusion, uh, you essentially have less piping for the blood to flow through and therefore you get increased pulmonary vasculature resistance. Now, this in turn results in an increase in heart rate as the heart attempts to maintain cardiac output against the increased pressures. There are also subsequent increases in, um, so the subsequent increases in the pulmonary vessel resistance also lead to over distension of the right ventricle, increased right ventricular end diastolic pressure and decreased right ventricular output. Now, as the right ventric ventricle fails, this results in decreased left ventricular filling and hence decreased left ventricular preload. Now, because of that, you can get the decreased cardiac output. The end effect of this is a increased heart rate with a decreased blood pressure. So it's through this process that the pulmonary embolism can result in obstructive shock and death if left untreated. Now, let's just talk about the etiology of the thrombi. So, as I said, there was those three factors Vokau's tried, the stasis, the hypercoagulable state, and the endothelial injury. So within stasis, so that could be things like immobilization. So the patient's just not moving, so there's no uh, movement of blood in the deep venous system. It could be such things as varicose veins, which allows for the pooling of blood due to the faulty um, valves or CCF where you got a failing heart and fluid overload leading to pooling of, the, of blood in the deep venous system. Uh, hypercoagulable states, so there's a few of those, so you know, surgery, malignancies, any inherited thrombophilia, uh, nephrotic syndrome, um, IBD, sepsis, high estrogen states or any hormone use. Uh, estrogen hormone use, so OCP, HRT. Um, and then endothelial injury, so surgery, trauma requiring a GA, a diabetes from the larger amounts of sugar, or hypertension. Uh, when I'm considering the etiology, I also like to consider the aspects of the Wells criteria and the Perk rule, which are the risk stratification tools, which I'll go into a bit more on in a coming slide. So then they have some of these etiology included, so immobilization, surgery, malignancy, recent trauma, as well as hormone use. So clinical features. So the typical thing people think about is dyspnea and chest pain. So dyspnea, it's typically of an acute onset, occurs in 50% of patients with PE and tachypnea is present in 
roughly 30% of patients. Uh, the chest pain is typically non-central. It's a pleuritic chest pain and of acute onset and occurs in 40% of patients. It results from pleural irritation from pulmonary infarction. Uh, it's important to note that this, the chest pain can actually be reproduced on palpation as you're kind of causing more of that irritation by pushing against that pleural, uh, pulmonary infarction and getting that pleural irritation. So you can't use um, pain reproduced on palpation as something to rule out PE. And there might be con concurrent signs of DVT. So that's in 24% of patients. So that's, um, you know, unilateral leg swelling, erythema, and uh, tenderness in the calf. There might be hypoxemia. So that occurs in 60% of patients and they have SpO2 less than, nine, less than 94. Features of shock, so 5% are hemodynamically unstable on presentation. And then it's interesting to note that cough is only present in 23% of patients and that classical sign that we're all taught to look at for hemoptysis is only present in 8% of patients. And often people mistake uh, a bleed from elsewhere, so like an, or an oral bleed or a esophageal bleed as um, hemoptysis. So here's those scoring tools we're talking about. So um, the Wells criteria is this first scoring tool and it's got a few different things you look at. So clinical signs and symptoms of DVT, no alternative diagnosis, heart rate greater than 100, immobilized for greater than three days of surgery in the previous four weeks, previous DVT or PE, hemoptysis, malignancy with active treatment in the past six months or under palliative care, and uh, then you get a pretest clinical probability. Now, I like using the, the three-fold risk approach, so low risk, moderate risk, and high risk. So for that, any patient who's got less than two on the wells, they're low risk, a moderate risk is a patient with two to six, and high risk is anyone with more than six. And they, the mortality, I mean, the chance of them having a PE is 1.3%, 16.2%, and 37.5% respectively. Now, once you've done the WELLS score, and if you get a low risk score on the WELLS, you can then proceed and do a PERC rule. Now, for the PERC rule to be fulfilled, they have to have none of the below. So age greater than 50, heart rate greater than 100, O2 sets on room air less than 95, prior history of DVT or PE, recent trauma or surgery, hemoptysis, exogenous estrogen use, or unilateral leg swelling. So if none of those are present and their well score was less than two, then you don't have to do any further investigations because you've essentially ruled that PE. At least you don't have to do any further investigations for PE. If they get a moderate risk or a high risk score, then high risk you'll be proceeding with a CTPA and moderate risk you might be proceeding with a CTPA, you might do a D-dimer depending on their clinician. So investigation, so some initial ones. So you're just gonna do some basic bloods, FBC, EUC, LFTs, coax, troponin and D-dimer potentially. I found when I was in the ED that it's often helpful you collect a green tube and a purple tube because you, you nearly always need those. And then you do the blue tube, collect the blue tube, which you can run your coax and D-dimer on and send it off to the lab. And then because you've collected it, the lab has it. So if they're on discussion with your seniors, they think a D-dimer is warranted then you don't have to collect more blood. You've already collected it. So you can just add on a D-dimer and they can run it for you. Um, so ECG findings. So most commonly it's a sinus tachy and um, nothing else. That's the most common finding. Other findings is the classic description of S1. So that's S waves and deep S waves in lead one, Q waves in lead three and inverted T waves in lead three but that only occurs in 20% of patients. So despite being the classic description, it's not that common. Uh, the other thing you might see is a right ventricular strain pattern. So that's T wave inversion in the right precordial leads. 
as well as, um, or potentially in the inferior leads as well. So chest x-ray, it's typically normal, but there may be atelectasis, pleural effusion, or elevation of the hemidiaphragm. ABG, so typically uh, the ABG picture is hypoxemia and hypocapnia uh, with a respiratory alkalosis. So the hypoxemia is because there's lung tissue that's not getting, uh, not getting supplied with that deoxygenated blood to facilitate gas exchange. And the hypocapnia is because of the increased respiratory rate leading to the breathing off of CO2, which is what results in the respiratory alkalosis. So the investigations, so apart from your basic initial ones, so the next, the kind of diagnostic, or the, the thing that's gonna make the diagnosis is the CTPA. So with a CTPA, you get direct visualization of the thrombus in the pulmonary arteries, and it can result in a partial or complete filling defect. You may also see some signs of RV enlargement. So in this one, we can see this here is that embolus, and in this case, it's a big saddle embolus. Otherwise, um, if the patient's unstable, a bedside echo might be useful in aiding diagnosis and can show signs of right ventricular dysfunction. And a VQ scan can be considered in patients in where CTPA is contraindicated. So those are people with renal impairment, contrast allergy, or the young and pregnant. Useful to note that at the moment, um, as a CTP, I mean, as a VQ scan is an aerosolizing, uh, aerosolizing procedure, they're not currently being done with uh, COVID precautions or weren't when I last checked. So then management. So in the hemodynamically stable patient, it's anticoagulation. So an oral factor 10A inhibitor is preferred a pixaban 10 milligrams BD for seven days and then five milligrams BD or rivaroxaban 15 milligrams BD for 21 days and then 20 milligrams daily. You can use warfarin or dabigatran uh, in peas which are associated with cancer or pee during pregnancy. Then you want to use parenteral agents such as dolteparin and anoxaparin. IV heparin is used in those patients who have severe renal impairment or those who have a high risk of bleeding that may require rapid reversal. Now, the length of anticoagulation is a bit tricky and best left to the wise hematologists. Um, but in a P resulting from a major provoking factor, which is no longer present. So that's those things we talked about earlier. So that could be surgery or uh, immobilization or trauma. Um, so once that's all sorted, then that provoking factor is no longer there, then the anticoagulant can be ceased after three months. But that's a decision again for hematologists. Unprovoked PE may require lifetime anticoagulation, and that will be at the uh, discretion of the clinician, so hematology again. Now, venous filters, which is, uh, you know, you place a filter in the IVC to prevent any clots coming up, are not commonly used in the prevention of PE. If the patient's hemodynamically unstable, then you definitely want to get senior support and or critical care involvement. These patients are probably going to be in the resus area of your ED, and respiratory support is going to be needed. So high concentration oxygen, consider mechanical ventilation. You want to potentially do some fluid resuscitation, but you want to be cautious. So if the systolic blood pressure is less than 90 or there are signs of shock, then you'll go with a 500 mil fluid challenge. Now, the reason we don't want to, you know, just pump in liters of fluid is because uh, we'll be placing more strain on the right ventricle and Therefore, we can have worse outcome. So in the patients who can't, you can't get that BP up with some, uh, with a cautious fluid resus, you might need vasopressors. 
and they may be required post thrombolysis if the BP is still low. But you'll be, you know, getting seniors in before those decisions are made. Anticoagulation, so 10,000 units of uh, unfractionated heparin IV loading dose, and then 18 units per kilogram per hour, adjust as per their APTT. And then thrombolysis, so you can the agents which are used are alteplase, streptokinase, or urokinase. And then after you've done your initial treatment with the unfractionated heparin, you switch to low molecular weight heparin. Uh, from the Paranux, Apixaban or Rivaroxaban. So if the above fails, you know, nothing happens with anticoagulation, you thrombolyze, no benefit there, then you can consider surgical pulmonary embolectomy or percutaneous catheter-directed therapy, which is where they, with the percutaneous catheter-directed therapy, they um, provide the anticoagulant at the site. So let's just go over a, a case. So this is James Smith. He's a 58-year-old man who presents with shortness of breath and chest pain. You're reading through the um, triage information, and it says that he's got a pleuritic chest pain, 8 out of 10, sharp, left-sided, peripheral near the armpit. Suddenly started this evening while watching TV two hours ago. Simultaneously became short of breath. There was cough, but no hemoptysis. Pretty in-depth tri triage info, actually. Um, and then observations at triage. So respirate was 22, SpO2 was 93%, heart rate 110, blood pressure 105 and 80, and temperature 37 degrees. And you can see him, he's clutching at his chest, obviously in pain. Um, so you see James, and um, you get some further history and you find out that he was recently discharged from hospital one week ago following a ORF for a tibia fracture, which is sustained during a motorbike accident. Um, he hasn't been mobilizing as much while at home as it's been hard to get in to see a physio due to coronavirus precautions. His past medical history, he's got hypertension and hypercholesterolemia, but he doesn't report any history of cancer, DVT in the past or previous PEs. He takes ramipril, 5 milligrams daily, and atorvastatin, 20 milligrams. Uh, so family history is that he's quite worried. Uh, he's quite worried that he's having a heart attack. And he's bringing it up because he's stating that his father died at the age of 55 from a heart attack. Lifestyle, he's a non-smoker. He drinks three to four stubbies at the pub every couple of days. And social uh, is that he works as a welder and lives at home with his wife. Now, while you're doing that history, you decide to give aspirin, 300 milligrams, because you've decided to follow the chest pain pathway, because he's come in with that chest pain. And then you also consider giving him some GTN. However, you decide not to give it due to his uh, lowish blood pressure and, had, and because GTN can drop the blood pressure. So you give him some analgesia instead, as he, he, he seems to be in quite a lot of pain. So you give him some morphine, 5 milligrams IV. Now, you've, you know, you've done that, you've got oxygen running at four liters, nasal prongs, his respirate's now 18, sats are up to 96%, heart rate is 96, and blood pressure is 110 on 80, and his temperature is 36.8. So a bit of an improvement from what he came in on. Examination-wise, you uh, do a cardio exam. He's got cap brief for less than two seconds. He's got regularly regular radial pulse. Doesn't have an elevated JVP. He's got moist mucous membranes. Heart sounds a dual pneumonia. There's no pedal edema. His chest, he's got vesicular breath sounds with some rails. And his calves are soft, non-tender. His left leg is in a brace with his right calf slightly larger than the left, but no erythema. So, Next, you look at your scoring tools. So using the well score, he gets three, placing him in a moderate risk group. So he's he's doesn't he's he has the heart rate greater than a hundred, and he's also got um, surgery in the previous four weeks. So that's a score of three. 
a bit hard to say that he's got clinical signs and symptoms of the DVT because of the boot, but he at least scores free, placing him in the moderate risk group. And you're unable to use the PERC rule to rule out pulmonary embolism because he's moderate risk. So you organize some basic investigations and ECG gets done. And this is what you, you, the nurses show you. So essentially it's a sinus tachycardia um, with no other significant abnormalities. So that's pretty standard for PE. You get some bloods done and you do an FPC, you do a troponin and you do EEC. At the moment, you don't do a D-dimer due to his risk profile. And you do a chest, organize for a chest X-ray and a CTPA. So some of the investigations come back. Uh, the first troponin comes back as negative. The FBC and the UC were unremarkable. The chest X-ray gets done and it's a largely normal chest X-ray with no significant findings. A second troponin, you send that off while you're waiting for your patient to go to CT and you also complete a second ECG, which is similar to the first. So eventually you get your CTPA back and there's a intraluminal filling defect, which you can see here, as well as corresponding lung infarction, which you can see here. So there's your diagnosis. You guys have diagnosed a, C a PE on the CTPA. So because his OBS had improved, you start him on some apixaban, 10 milligrams BD for seven days, and then five milligrams BD, as well as some supportive management. And he improves on that. And he's cardiovascularly stable. You also admit the patient under the respiratory team and you give yourself a pat on the back for diagnosing your first PE and treating it successfully. Um, thank you so much for listening. Hope it's been a, a bit of an educational talk and not too boring. Thanks.